Hey everybody, welcome back to uh, East Oak Studio for Oil Painting from Life. Uh, we're also going to be not only oil painting from life, but we are uh, drawing from life today as well. Uh, we have two great artists with us today. Uh, one of our guest artists who is also doing a live stream tutorial video with us. Brock Larson is here. Come over here and say hey to everybody in the camera. Hello. And so uh, he's actually going to be doing a live stream with this live stream workshop on uh, drawing the portrait over the next several days. So check that out. Uh, if you notice, this time we actually have our website down below. And if you have any questions while we're painting, please, uh, we love to be interactive with our audience. Um, all you need to do if you're on our website, if you look in the bottom corner, you'll see um, a YouTube logo. You can click that YouTube logo and there's a, a chat feed and you can uh, ask questions there. And then uh, Lisa will be, who's on our switcher, will be asking us the questions and we'll be answering them as we paint. Um, we also have Brett here with us today. He's Hello. been with us before and this time we're actually going to have him on camera. So we're really excited about that as well and he'll Thank be you. interacting with us. So today we're going to be uh, drawing and painting the lovely Hannah. And uh, we're so happy that she has um, participated with us today. And uh, without further ado, we're going to get right into it. So cool. Um, I always feel like at the very beginning, Everybody gets really quiet because we're like having to block in. So you might, it might be silent for a little bit. So uh, people that are watching from all over the place, give a shout out. We love to hear about who's watching from around the world uh, or locally. If you're like right here in Raleigh, we want to know that too. So all right, all right. we are ready to go. All right, <clears throat> I find sometimes I start talking to myself like as if I'm by myself, and then I realize I'm mic'd up. <laughs> and everybody's listening, and I'm like, yeah, no, that's not good. Why did I do that? <laughs> yeah, go, go. Exactly. Oh, what do I have on my list? It was such an amazing football game yesterday. <laughs> if I had the force, what would I do with it? <laughs> You know, so, so many of these times, I was saying this off camera a minute ago, I'm frantically trying to get ready. Um, and for the first time in a while, I'm actually prepared to uh, start painting right away. So I feel like I actually get an extra 20 minutes that I typically don't get. <laughs> process for all for all of uh, our audience out there if y'all go I think about two uh, painting from life's earlier um, we actually did have we didn't know it but we had the mics on um, about t 10 minutes before it started and it was it was like live but we didn't have the film going <laughs> and and um, Divya was switching switchering on and we we had like a major problem happen 
and I'm like running around panicking on uh, several different things. And then I look at her and she has a panic look on her face. And I'm like, Davia, what's wrong? <laughs> and it's all recorded live. <laughs> so the experience, I guess, the right just live stream. It's, yeah. it's real. <laughs> That's right. That's the beauty of this. You, you get a, a real sense of what, <laughs> what we, uh, the raw of, mm -hmm. of the artist here. There's nothing nothing uh, sugar-coated or any veneer put on this situation. Every bad mark that goes down, yep. <laughs> it's out there. Every bad word you say when that bad mark goes down. <laughs> that has actually been one of the things that I've liked most about uh, you guys being around here is that, at, and uh, giving out the free content, because we've tuned into kind of all of them and helping kind of do dispel some of the myths that every art piece that you make, you know, that you see out there uh, started out perfectly or, yep. or wasn't with any sort of, uh, sort of struggle. No, oh, man. There is all sorts of struggle going on all the time. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've said this several times on the live streams, but the, one of the beauty, beauties of it is we want artists to be able to see the struggle because I think that when I was starting out in my my career you know you feel like you're alone in that um and so i'm like you know what it'd be good for them for people to see that no matter at what stage you're in there's times where you're trying to experiment on things and you're trying to push yourself and so you struggle and that's just part of the the whole experience as an artist um we had a guy um I think it was the last time it was we did with uh, T.J. Cunningham, and he was asking about, do y'all ever get like depressed about what you're doing, or or as an artist, and are you going to make it, and are you, you know, was asking some really awesome, real questions, and we we're like, yeah, no, that's <laughs> uh, that's a real thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, without those down <clears throat> kind of moments, we wouldn't really get to appreciate the like the creative highs when we're in high creative mm -hmm. production. It's kind of the get both yeah support each other. That's true. Yeah, it's kind of the myth of the of the um, of happiness that you're just uh, constantly being all the, all of the time. Yeah. Being, so. yeah, that'd be boring. <laughs> I was even saying, I was like, and I'm like one of the more optimistic guys you will ever meet, you know, uh, and boy, I have some, some serious low days here and there. Um, so, you know, what we do is hard. So my dear housemates, uh, Alex Venezia and Divya Meluca are coming back today. They've been on a two-month hiatus in Australia, and because uh, that's where Divya is from. And they are coming back tonight, so I'm really excited about getting to see them and hear about their experience. It's kind of crazy that they went right during like all these fires, mm -hmm. you know. So they got to experience it firsthand. So we have a lot of people writing in from all over, saying hi. Awesome. And Maru T asks, any big projects for the new year? Oh, man. Brock, you want to start with that? <laughs> yeah, let's see. 
big projects. Well, <clears throat> um, at the Great Lakes Academy, we're going to be graduating our first uh, crew of students. Our initial um, first five are going to be moving on, and so we're, the big goal is to get them through that. Um, yeah, other than that, just keep painting, get better at painting. And I've got a few larger projects in, in process right now, so yeah, how about you? Um, wow, yeah, I'm, I'm working on, um, I don't know, I'm working on a, some passion projects that have been s sort of things I've been thinking about and in the works for a couple of years now, but I haven't really had the time because I've been working so hard to get East Oaks Studio up and running. Um, but it's sort of more poetic work. I do a lot of commission work. Um, and I'm really excited about trying to do sort of a particular series. Um, I grew up on a farm, and so I'm going to do sort of a series that, you know, they say paint what you know, right? And so I'm going to work on doing a series that's kind of based on more of a rural environment, kind of like where I grew up. Cool. And. Um, East Oaks has a lot of plans for this year, you know, of, of artists that we have coming and, you know, so I'm excited to see where that goes. So those are two um, major things, you know, that we have going on. I'm teaching a decent amount of workshops and so doing a lot of traveling for that and you know, it's funny because you think you're busy and then the next year comes along and you realize you're busier. <laughs> and, then, and then you're like, gosh, you can't get any more busy than that. And then it gets more busy. <laughs> and it keeps getting more busy. <clears throat> so um, so I'm, every, every month feels pretty darn full. Uh, so it's one of those things where to protect your time as a, as a painter, you have to really like think about it. Mm -hmm. Brett, what you got going on, man? Um, Lisa and I are just uh, trying to transition out of, uh, still, still kind of transitioning out of the academic role and try to uh, make some creative pieces. Oh, nice. Lisa had a self-portrait, um, and we've just been uh, drawing portraits of each other, uh, kind of getting warmed up and letting ideas kind of uh, formulate. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, I saw that portrait of her. It's. Awesome. Have you, you've posted it, haven't you, Lisa? Have you posted that picture yet? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, everybody needs to check that out. You need to give a shout out to what your um, Instagram is so that people can go look at it. I mean, if you don't want to, that's cool too. No. <laughs> Trying to turn it on. Oh, thanks, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> it's at Lisa Jacoby Downey. And speaking of the Great Lakes Academy, there's a few people saying hi. Uh, Nelia Harper. Hey. And Eric Ravola. Hey. <laughs> hey. Give your best Fonzie. Eric, my dude. Hey. Bob Koppel asks, are you painting on a smooth surface? I am, I am painting on dye bond, which is, it originally is a smooth surface, but mine tends to be a little bit more textured because I put a ground on it. Uh, the ground that I put on it is um, made by Rubelev, um, or which is also the same company as Natural Pigments. And um, it's called Lead, 
alkyd ground. And um, basically I take a foam roller um, that you could buy at any like Lowe's and I put the ground on and I roll the foam roller over it and it gives it kind of a texture that's a little bit more coarse than like an eggshell texture but seems very similar to like a um, kind of a canvas texture and I really like it. I, I, I think it just gives me the sensation of canvas without it being canvas. I love that you have some of the uh, Great Lakes students watching, um, or Great Lakes Academy people. So Brock and his dad, Jeffrey Larson, both started a art school up in Duluth, Minnesota, um, called Great Lakes Academy of Art. Y'all should check out their website and see what they're all about. Um, they have really great instruction both of them um, just their combined experience is um, pretty astounding and we've I, my, my partner Michael and I have been up multiple times to see what they're working on up there and it's just really awesome so if any of y'all are looking to for a place of, of to learn and to mentor either workshops or anything similar um, you know, or a full-time student process, um, check them out. It's really great. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, the, um, the website is about to go through some changes. We haven't really done much to it since we first set it up. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> yeah. Kind of terrible like that. Same with my own website. I need to Gosh, I didn't have do to... some work on it. But not always the way, man. Yeah, this is our <clears throat> fourth year of the program, so we'll be graduating our first batch, and uh, it's crazy how fast four years go. Gosh, I know, man. Like, as a student, it flew by, and I think it went even faster uh, helping instruct. Yeah, I could see that. I tell you, um, the place is gorgeous. What they did was they outfitted a, um, an old historic church. It was a historic landmark in Duluth, Minnesota, and they... Um, they have really made it into something special. They've preserved a lot of, it, it was originally built, hey, correct any history problems mm -hmm. yeah, that I have no. here. It was originally built by uh, Italian Masons because there was a lot of Italian immigrants up there, um, Masons that were building other buildings, and they were, at the time, I believe, sort of the ones that were uh, ostracized, ostracized mm -hmm. from yeah, the community. Correct. And uh, so they were like, you know what, we'll, we'll build our own church if you won't let us go to yours. And so it's all on their own time, like after work. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, it's just a really stunning um, building and they have turn, turned it into a school and it's just, it's pretty awesome. Seen something somewhere where you guys, uh, Brock, are you guys doing a lot of your own uh, kind of reconstruction or rehab mm -hmm. work there? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty much 18, 18 straight months of renovating. 18 and then straight the, months of heartache and frustration. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, we were also, we had our first group of students through most of that too, so they. Definitely got to be a part of that. And we didn't have heat until like maybe mid-November the first year, so they were all drawing in you know, gloves. and They didn't even really have a classroom. They were up in the balcony because we were fixing up the main floor. Um, yeah, they've wow. got a lot of good stories about that. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's those character building stories. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we're very fortunate. It's a, it's a great studio space. Um, you got to tell some of the stories when they come to mind of <laughs> the experience when of. Um, Developing that place. I tell you that you know, I, one of my favorite I, that I've heard so far is that students were actually up there working, and y'all didn't even have like permits yet for <laughs> for them to be actually going to school. And someone called you out on it or something. What was that about? Yeah, we had a close call at one time. <laughs> yeah, we got don't our, don't we got don't our permits, don't out yourself that. enough. You're <laughs> yeah. you're being recorded right now. Yeah. But, um, no, we had our permits. <laughs> You had your permits, yeah. but something was wrong. <laughs> That's a different story you're thinking about. <laughs> Everything was on the up and up, Lewis. One of my favorite stories, and I was there critiquing when it happened, was um, uh, there was some jackhammering going on in the lower floor, and uh, the students were working on these, just like these foam, like simple shapes, like a sphere. Mm -hmm. And um, I just remember trying to critique it and watching it kind of like <laughs> move around on the table from the jackhammer downstairs. <laughs> it's like making it even more difficult. Uh, so anyone who's interested, I didn't say this at the beginning, um, if you want to paint along with us, and the great thing about this is recorded on YouTube, and you can go back and watch it as much as you want, but if you want to paint along with us for anyone who's new, you can submit your email and you will have access not only to these reference photos of all of our vantage points, so there'll be all three different vantage points, but also all the live streams previous um, and the photo, reference photos of the portraits on those too. So you get sort of a big well of access to all of the reference images. So uh, just submit your email in um, on East Oaks website and uh, you'll get access to that. We'd love, we've had several people um, send us their paintings that they've done and, you know, we always enjoy seeing that. You know, it, it makes us feel ex excited about it because, you know, it's hard to get all this set up and it, it makes it feel worthwhile when we know that y'all um, are enjoying it and, and care enough to want to paint along and experience the situation with us. And that brings us to the tournaments. Sweet. Five minute break. That flew by. Yeah, so fast, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> All right, everybody, we're going to take a break real quick. Uh, the audio will be off for just a moment, um, and we will be right back. Seems a little, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Read my mind. <laughs> So Lewis, David asks, do you have special lighting in the studio to help you paint so it gets true color accuracy to daylight? That's a really good, uh, really good question. Yeah, so we use a, um, we use a film light. It's originally used in the filming industry, so works perfect for what we're doing for like painting from life, but also I use it as an aid to my skylights that I paint from. <clears throat> so on a really, say, a, a very dark, overcast, cloudy day, uh, when it gets really dark, it's great to aid uh, in making sure you have enough light to paint. 
and um, it is made by a company called Aperture, and it is called a 120D, and basically they make two different types, one that's twice as powerful uh, than the 120, I think it's like 300 or something, and um, they're really, really great. So they have this thing called CRI, and basically it just means that it holds true to the full amount of color spectrum that you can get in um, a particular type of warm or cool. So this is set to what they call 5200 Kelvin, um, which is very close to like a very light overcast day. So it's not as blue as blue sky, but it's most certainly not as warm as like your soft light in your house. So it's much more on the cool side, but it's just a really good white light and helps with um, getting more true to the colors. Um, I don't know if that helps. You can, you can find more information about them on like B&H, um, which is like a photography and film catalog. Um, that's where we bought ours, I think. And um, there's a lot of other light companies that do something very similar. It's an LED light, and so it uses very little power and can last forever. And um, it's a little heavy and clunky if you're, if you're traveling with it. And I do a lot of traveling with it because I do a lot of my um, um, portraits from it. So, but Aperture does make a lighter version. Um, it's just not as powerful of a light. Yeah, it, it really does read as natural light. It's nice. Yeah, if you didn't know any better, it, it, uh, you, you would, if you were looking just on the camera, it feels like there's like a, a side window letting in light, you know. What do you use, what light do y'all use at your uh, school, Brock? I can't remember the name of it, but... It shifts um, from warm to cool, doesn't it? It does, yeah, you can adjust the, the warmth and cool and... Uh, the brightness, so it works great. It's pretty powerful. Um, I should ask about that so I can so I can respond. It's all right. I know that the one I was talking about that's a little bit smaller, more transportable. It does exactly that. It can shift um, very warm to very cool. So if you want a particular scenario or situation um, that that would call for that, um, it's it's capable. I'm going to put just a little bit of the background color in so I can get some context here. Reggie wants to know what kind of paper is the charcoal drawing being worked on? This one here is uh, uh, Reeves BFK. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's got kind of a beige uh, tone to it. And then I covered up um, that with uh, uh, just some chalk. Um, I think it's a new pastel brand. Um, they make these uh, pastel sticks, and uh, I just covered up with, with a layer of that and kind of ground it in with a paper towel. And so that way I can wipe off uh, some of the lights uh, to kind of reveal more of a, a, hopefully, more of a flesh tone, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Brock, what are you using? Um, <clears throat> this is just uh, Strathmore multimedia paper. And I toned it with um, India ink. Oh, nice. So I kind of combined like a, a sepia India ink and a um, 
burnt umber. So it can kind of play around with the warms and cools. And it's a great texture of paper. It's not super smooth like Bristol or their drawing paper, but it's, um, it's not too rough like watercolor paper. Nice. This angle is so much more, uh, or it's a lot more different than the last angle. I was like dead on the light, um, last painting from life. So this one has like the right lake light raking over it a little bit more. So it's a um, totally different set of our things to think about. Sandy says hi from your friend Sandy in Chapel Hill. Can oh, you each say, Sandy. Oh, can you each say something about how you measured to block on the model's face? Uh, you know what? <laughs> I don't think I've taken a measurement this uh, time around. Um, I typically do to double check things. Um, it's one of those things where you, you have such a limited time that uh, you just kind of start going for it, and I've been like just doing it based off of shadow shape. But um, now that you say that, <laughs> <laughs> who needs measurements? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, so, but typically, I mean, I, I'll, I'll definitely measure the half and try to find the half, which typically f finds itself between right around the tear duct. And just see what is different from what is typical in your head. So oftentimes you have like the ideal in your mind and then people, what creates the identity in people is what deviates from the, the ideal thing that you have in your head. Um, and so you start finding those measurements and you kind of know where to start by knowing what the ideal is, but then realize, okay, now how do I shift it to really capture the identity of the, of the person. So then I'll go and check on her, and I'll also use a lot of tilts where I'll measure um, kind of like a triangulation type way of measuring where I'll like find the tilt of her eyes, and I also know that that creates a parallel tilt to the nose and the mouth. And then <coughs> um, 
I'll also use that to like locate things. So I'll find like a tilt between like the tear duct and say the tear duct in the corner of the nose. And then I'll measure it on her and then go back and see if it's close on this. And that helps me sort of hone in on where, um, where the portrait is going. So um, in some of these scenarios, just because we're going so quickly, um, I just kind of go for it and, and hope something um, comes of it. I also find that I'm like trying to do all the things all at once, you know, so I'm measuring and putting in color and blocking in all sort of at the same time because of just the limited amount of time. It's a great exercise. Um, I typically am a slow painter, so what happens is I, I tell people it's kind of like a marathon runner trains for both speed and um, endurance. And what we're doing here is speed training, just like a marathon runner would go and run like three mile sprints or two mile sprints is to kind of condition his body to be able to understand what the speed feels like. Um, and then he'll go and do like, we'll, we'll go and make like a long pose, which would be very similar to uh, a runner going for long distance running and uh, training his body to condition it to be able to do the distance and understand what that feels like. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's great to do both. Just kind of that cross training idea. I have a similar way of blocking it where it's just pretty, pretty visual at first. It's just kind of playing around with shapes as I see them. And basically I'm just giving myself something to correct or something mm -hmm. to come in and fix with the, the actual measurements. Right. I used to always just construct, you know, pretty carefully, you know, kind of a connect the dot kind of system where everything was measured out before I drew anything and it still never really turned out right and it took twice as long, so I kind of switched. Yeah, there's something, there's something that you create a particular type of energy this way too if you don't rely so heavily on measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of makes your drawing and everything almost feel a bit wooden um, and mm -hmm. stiff. It's pretty, yeah. Uh, and so this, by doing it this way, it allows for a little bit more energy to be in there. I, I love the idea of measurement uh, confirming what you've put down versus it controlling what you need to put down. Um, Brett, you have any tricks up your sleeve or things that you do? Um, yeah, I just kind of start off with uh, uh, with a kind of a rough um, schema or, or uh, shape of a skull, mm -hmm. uh, and then I try to build on top of that. So I find uh, if I can if I can kind of get that initial under armature uh, somewhat accurate, anyways. Um, and then I kind of put a block in off of off of that. So, um, but we'll see. I'm I'm not the most accurate draftsman. So, um, so That's good. I should measure a lot more. But I feel like you wear it, uh, the more you measure, the more it kills it. And so confirming uh, what your kind of intuition is from mm -hmm. beginning, maybe with a little bit of measurement, or just uh, trying to trust your eye as much as possible. And, and uh, if you do it enough times. It, it starts to it, it starts to improve, but there's kind of um, there's kind of no shortcuts. I think to just mm -hmm. uh, just keeping on doing it over and over and over again. But generally, like um, you know, uh, chin to nose uh, to brow line to the uh, uh, to the top of the forehead. I, I think it's thirds, and then you have a half point. Around So that, that sort of stuff, I guess, is sort of permanently in my mind. 
How much time we have left on this one? Yeah. Seeing what kind of pacing I need to do here. Sometimes I'll, I'm like working on this, but I also kind of like, what, what are you guys doing? What are you doing over here? <laughs> it's hard for me to cheat. Yeah, cheat. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Awfully quiet. Um, all right, everybody, our audience needs to keep up with us now. Where, uh, where is everybody from? People need to chime in and let us know where they're watching from. There's been quite a few say. Let me see here. Oh, okay. Right now, they're like screaming at the YouTube. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> we have Boston, Cary, oh, sweet. North Carrie. Carolina, sweet. South Carolina, Sarasota, Japan, Peru. Wow, that's cool. California. Wisconsin, Oregon, Maryland. Hannah, you're quickly becoming famous. Mm. All over the world. Minnesota, Vienna, <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> Mexico, did you say? What were those last three? Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Vienna and Netherlands. Wow. Oh, and Chile. Wow. <laughs> Sweet. That's incredible. Michael should be watching in right now. New He's Zealand. in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? What was that last one? New Zealand. Oh, sweet. Uh, we have Columbia, uh, Cambridge, uh, and Ireland. Wow. Thanks, guys. Thanks for uh, shouting out. We really appreciate it. That's really amazing. All right, we're gonna take a break. Um, I'm gonna go get some paints and put some more paints on.
So Lucas asks, what colors are you guys using? Well, I'm assuming <laughs> that he's talking to me. Uh, <laughs> using gray. Yeah, I'm using black and black. Just using gray. Um, I am using, at this moment, I'm using a mixture of <clears throat> French ultramarine blue and transparent oxide red. And that's just for, I'm just start, starting to create sort of my darker darks to see where I want to go with this. Um, and so I'm kind of in the hair. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm going to establish my dark so that I can also establish, and my light, so that I can kind of like work between that range. Um, but I, I then will go, I use a lot of oxide yellow and uh, violet, manganese violet. And then as I go up into the lights, I'll use raw sienna and, um, and alizarin crimson. And I'll also do a bit of vermilion in there as well. And I use that as sort of my substitute for cadmium red. Everything else, uh, I use a decent amount of cobalt and, and viridian as well as my sort of neutralizers of those skin tones. But um, I, the, everything else is sort of like a color to support those when I'm working with portrait. Miss Sandy, if you're still watching, you need to come by and visit us. I hadn't seen you in a while. So you need to come over to East Oak Studio and come say hey. And that goes for most anyone. If y'all are ever in the area from all those people that are around the world, if you're ever in Raleigh, North Carolina, <laughs> please uh, contact us. Come stop by, say hey. We love visitors. I'm a man that embraces distraction way too much, so come be a distraction for me. Sophia would like to know, where is your favorite place to paint? Brock, that's like a great question for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my favorite place. Um, well, I, my wife and I own 10 acres about a half hour from Duluth uh, into Wisconsin, kind of off the south shore of Superior. And, um, there was a summer, I think it was two summers ago, I just kind of buckled down and painted there like all the time, every day. And I love just kind of that idea of finding one place and just finding the beauty there. Um, but I think you can kind of find that anywhere you go. But that's my favorite place, I guess. The South Shore, as well as the North Shore. That sounds awesome. You said you've been painting around your kind of hometown, the area you yeah, grew up in. Yeah, I um, I went home um, to my hometown in the fall, late fall, and um, my dad was a cotton farmer, and um, and so 
it's been a while since I've seen the the cotton defoliating is what they call it, but it's when the cotton blooms. So um, I went down there and you know painted and took shots of it, and I even did like some drone stuff with it because it's just so beautiful. It's, a, it's such a unique thing to see. Um, you don't see it in many other places aside from uh, the South. You can you see it a little bit around here, but it's just such fertile land that the cotton's really, really pretty there. So it's very inspiring. Uh, so I am gonna be doing some paintings that have cotton in them, in cotton fields. Kind of fun to have that connection to it too, just from growing up there and yeah, you know, other than just the visual. Oh man, I grew up it and grow up there, worked in those fields for seven years. Um, I, I know those fields very well, um, and it's been a lot of hard days uh, in those fields working. So it's it's most certainly in my blood. Um, I'd love to do, I was thinking also about doing some of like the rice fields and soybean fields because they all have unique looks too during either harvest. Rice would be fun to do when it's like, you know, really green. Uh, but soybeans would be a lot of fun to do when it's very golden and dry and dead. Um, it just has a lot of character to it. The, the land is incredibly flat, so like when you're talking about composition, you know, you don't have any like mountains to work with, so you got to work with like tree lines and, mm -hmm. and you come up with some, that's right, a little bit of a Wyethe composition to it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at like Thomas Hart Benton's work, he, he was so good at like creating, you know, all these diagonals and whimsical shapes even though like the land was very meadow and flat mm -hmm. where he painted. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I'd get that animated but it would be be fun to be able to like embrace the challenge. Yeah so that our property is like pretty dense woods for the most part and so it's just kind of like kind of a learning curve to just like not have a lot of variety in the landscape where it's mm. just a bunch of trees. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I kind of came to love it actually. There's a lot of decision making that goes into it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I've always loved Isaac Levitan, the, oh, the yeah. Russian landscape painter. If I could paint like anyone, it'd be him. But yeah, his wood yeah. scenes are just so, so yeah, inspiring. Incredible. What are, uh, aside from Levitan, who's some more of your um, influences and people that you just love to look at? Maybe you don't wait their work to look like them, but you love hmm. yeah, good their question. work. Um, I've been looking at uh, Willard Metcalf quite a bit. Oh, wow. If you're familiar okay, yeah. with him. Yeah, I am. Um, he maybe goes a little far into the uh, broken color, but um, a little farther than I would, I should say. Explain, but, also explain broken color to, to the audience. Yeah, it's kind of to create an effect, so you're not mixing the exact color note. Uh, you're kind of putting these notes that are the same, the same equal value of different colors right next to each other. And the idea is that you kind of let the viewer's eye mix them together. So it kind of creates this kind of vibrating kind of... Mm -hmm. um, kind An of artist like form of dot effect. matrix. Yeah. So it's great for landscape painting. It kind of can liven the scene.
as far as portraits, I've been looking at uh, Anthony Van Dyke quite a bit. Mm, yeah. It's just so good. He, uh, there was a show of his at um, the Frick yeah. when, I was at, when I was in New York. Where, did you come up at that time? Yeah, I know that, that was you the were last up time around that there. time. Yep. And uh, boy. So good. It's such an incredible show. I, I, you know, there are some things that, there's quite a few things I don't miss about New York, but boy, one of the things I do is you had a lot of incredible artwork at your fingertips. There's always something coming through. Yeah. But it gives great reason to go visit. No, I didn't. I actually didn't get to go see see that show. Um, oh yeah, I saw a lot of people posting about it. Actually, um, yeah, the the drawings seemed incredible. It would have been awesome to go see that. I also wanted to go see the the Bouguereau show that was in Memphis. I mean, it's, it's in, I think it's in California now. But my wife is from Memphis, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have an opportunity when I go deliver a portrait. And then I got delayed, and I missed it. I was so I was so sad because it's rare that a good show is in the South. Yeah, that show came through Milwaukee first, oh, did I think. It? Yeah, okay. so we did we did get to see it on one of the last days. Great show. That's awesome. Bob asks, what are your thoughts on using the Zorn palette? I, uh, well, I, I love the Zorn palette. If, if you go to, um, on YouTube, you'll see that I did a uh, affordable palette YouTube video, just like a free one, and I talk a lot about the Zorn palette, you know, because if you need just a few ideal colors um, to make a great painting, it's just such a variety you can do with such a small amount. Um, I love the idea of a limited colored palette because it forces artists to understand that sometimes having too much color on your palette can cr cause more problems than it can create solutions. So if you don't know what you're doing, you can actually end up um, hurting your painting more than you can help it. So. Um, by practicing with a limited palette, sometimes you actually are capable of like almost forcing yourself to be able to create color harmony without having to, I wouldn't say without having to try, but making it easier to create color harmony. Um, so there's just, you know, there's, there's just something about that palette that just really works. I highly recommend people 
to try it. If they're going to go like buy colors, if I have an artist friend and they're like, I really want to get started in, in doing portraits of, of people and I want to, where, what kind of colors should I buy? The first colors I would recommend to them is, is, is the Zorn colors. Just because it kind of gives them a little bit of a, an aid in not going crazy with <laughs> color. I always look at color, you, I would love to hear what you think, Brock, on this, but I always think of color like the more color you have, it's almost like you have, if you're like bouncing a stick on your finger and then you add another stick on top of that stick and then another stick on top of that stick, to be able to like balance the colors, you, you're having to like, the more color you add to your palette, it's almost kind of like you're you're having to like work with those and figure out how to make all of them balance well. And it's just a little bit more difficult, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's definitely more difficult. Um, yeah, and color is, I don't know, it's so subjective, but it's, I don't know, I love both. I love high chroma paintings and I also mm. love like, like the Zorn, just super muted. Um, so it really does kind of come down to a taste thing. I really like starting out <coughs> limited like as limited as possible, like the Zorn, and, um, and then adding if I need to, mm. uh, or through glazes. Because otherwise it's just a lot to juggle if you're trying to get your shapes correct and um, you know, your, your values, which are, both of those are more important than color. Right. Um, so by juggling a lot of color on your palette, you're just making it more difficult. Yeah. Um, but no, when, when heavy amount of color is done right, you know, I mean, your dad's a great example, you mm -hmm. know, I think of Jeff Hine, who's a great colorist, you know, Stephen the Sale, like all those people um, have become masters of knowing how to like balance a heavy amount of like chromatic color, uh, but they, they know how it works and they mm -hmm. know what what to do and what not to do to make the piece have a particular amount of grit or a particular amount of poetry that, mm -hmm. or harmony that, uh, with each other. Um, so. And it, it can become much truer to nature too if you are working with that range, like mm -hmm. much less of a translation. Yep. Less than a minute. Look at that, your like internal clock said, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's getting close. Hannah's up there rocking it. You can tell she's like, you can get it. She's like, no, nah, I'm feeling more confident about this. I got this. <laughs> Ready to break? All right. Five minute break, everybody. <clears throat> That's good. Thank you.
So Lewis, Sam asks, if you want the feel of Canvas, why don't you use Canvas? That's a good question. Um, the reason uh, that I don't use Canvas that much is a couple of reasons. One, I actually like the rigid surface of a panel. That's one of the reasons. Number two, the longevity of working on a rigid substrate actually is helpful for the longevity of your painting. Um, so canvas is very susceptible to humidity and expands and contracts and as the oil paint cures over time it um, gets more brittle. So paint doesn't dry, it cures kind of like concrete. It's a chemical reaction and oxidation that's happening um, with the paint, the oil, and the air. Um, so as it gets more stronger, you know, more brittle, and humidity keeps expanding and contracting, it ends up cracking the paint over time. Now, obviously, these are practice, and so it's not that big a deal whether this lasts for centuries or not. But you, if if that's what you want to paint on, then you need to practice on it. So that's one of the reasons why I. Um, still use it. The other reason is that it's cheaper. Um, I can buy this panel from your local sign store and get like a huge sheet of it for like $80. And when I mean a huge sheet, I mean an eight foot by four foot sheet. So um, the fact that I can get something so cheap also uh, is another reason why I like painting on it. Um, you know, if you can find something that's like one of the best surfaces to paint on and is also one of the most affordable, why not paint on it? So for all those reasons, um, and I think there are a few more, but I think that should be plenty for knowing why I prefer to paint on on a panel surface. So, but it still gives me that texture of canvas, which I like. Brett, what kind of, do you uh, have a preference on what kind of surface you paint on? Um, I was kind of uh, looking at yours because I, I've been uh, researching how to mount linen to the dye bond. Um, so mm -hmm. I can kind of do it on the cheap because it's, it's pretty expensive when you buy those. Oh, yeah. Because um, I, I like having a hard surface behind it and the idea of longevity. Um, but I also like the texture of canvas too. So mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. experiment with that. But I think in the meantime, I have a couple rolls of um, of Clausens that I'd be um, I'd be a horrible person. <laughs> I kind of go to waste. I do the wrong yeah, thing. yeah, no kidding. I have a lot lot left to go uh, on some Clausens only. So. No, I hear you. No, no, don't let anything go to waste. Uh, when you find that out, let me know. I've 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 tried multiple things. It, I, and I've found a lot of them have kind of come short. I've even had some people recently contact me and are like, what do you do if you want to mount it to that? And I'm like, that's one of the reasons I don't anymore is <laughs> I haven't right. found anything that doesn't like make it ripple up or so do I, something I, weird. Yeah, so I have found a few things. Um, I found a thread through uh, natural pigments. They're uh, painting best practices on, mm -hmm. on Facebook. Um, and I think Alia from Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Alia Elbermani. Elbermani um, had started the thread because she was looking to uh, mount these, uh, uh, mount canvas to some large uh, panels like that. And um, Camille Corey mm -hmm. chimed in, and also uh, Candace Bohannon uh, chimed in on that. And Candace, <clears throat> um, I, 
think, and also Carmen Drake Gordon, she uh, would use kind of a t-shirt or, or a, a hot press. Yeah. Um, but you can only get those so big. Mm -hmm. So some, uh, I think uh, Camille had recommended to find uh, one of the sign companies that has, uh, I think it's just a, a large heat press where they use that uh, BEVA, the BEVA yeah. film. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, and they uh, uh, heat press it to that. Whereas Candace uh, Bohannon said, I think she had, if you get uh, an iron at exactly the right temperature, that it won't scorch the canvas or hurt it, um, that you can get on that, that on there. But I've, I've seen a few people have problems with, uh, um, you know, later on developing a little bubble. Yeah. Or starting to peel up a little bit. Uh -huh. So um, I'm sure there's a learning curve to it that might be kind of expensive. Mm. Um, but short of that, using the Diva, I'm not sure uh, of a really good method for uh, mounting it. So that's where if you can afford the like those artifacts, yeah. those, that would be great. But um, I see why you're... Long story short, I see why you're your own canvas texture on there. It's a, it's a rabbit hole of, of different processes. But right. I, it's, um, but I would trust Candace and um, uh, uh, Camille. Definitely. Too, so. um, and that's the thing is that there's, there's people out there that, you know, if you're that kind of person that loves to, like, really get into... Um, you know, the science of it and what's going on. I mean, there is definitely resource out there. And Painting's Best Practice is such a great resource for it because, I mean, uh, I love to get into it a little bit. But I think what really happens to me is um, time becomes the issue. You know, it's like there's so many things I'd be interested in if I had the, the time to be interested in them. And so I'm, I'm always like, feel like I'm like, oh, that would be so cool. But... I'm, I am a serious walking distraction all the time, so I always have to be uh, on the look, look out of staying on task and diligent because um, that's something that I can really explore and go down this like huge rabbit hole. Oh yeah, yeah. A couple of people do that. I just don't know what happens with it later once you stretch it up. If you um, yeah hurt the integrity of it, but I think I'll be stretching stuff for a while while I do with this. I used to mount it to uh, Baltic Birch with um, um, this uh, acrylic uh, gel medium, mm -hmm. uh, but there's little pinholes. You wouldn't know it, but there's little pinholes in the uh, clausens, and some of that acrylic gel would inevitably it's a messy mm. process to um, to brayer all of that gel out it has to go somewhere so it's usually onto a table or, or on the floor so everywhere you don't want it like on the, yeah. like on the surface the <laughs> everywhere my wife would get mad <laughs> yeah. so, so a lot of people that want to know how to mount canvas on their own there's a, there's got to be a market there for do it yourself yeah There you go, out there, internet world, business idea right there. Jasper says, hello, Lewis, will you please talk about backgrounds, creating interesting brushwork while at the same time keeping it simple? So
so I wouldn't even know if I'm, I, I mean, I, I do my best. One of the things I, I do with backgrounds um, is so, it's so hard. I'm, I'm definitely one of those people that will like work on something, have something awesome, overwork it, be frustrated that I lost it, and then rework it to try to get it awesome again. And, and um, there's like a, <laughs> a real tension there. Um, but I mean, the first thing I, I would say is that like one of the things I like to do in my backgrounds is so, kind of like uh, Brock was talking about um, color is I try to create sort of like a slight change or a slight shift in warm and cool in like multiple layers so that it creates sort of this vibration that makes the backgrounds interesting. Um, and you know, I, I really think that the, one of the things, for me at least, the name of the game is, is like how can you make something feel unfinished and interesting at the same time? Um, because I think that part of something looking interesting, I mean, there's a lot of ways of making things look interesting, but um, I, I, I find there's a particular beauty in making something unfinished look really good. And so, um, and make it looking effortless. Don't know if, I don't think I'm a far cry from mastering it, but it's, it's definitely something that I like to do. So um, I think one of the things is the thing about composition and design and, you know, um, trying to like find sort of a path or an avenue that kind of cuts through um, your portrait or the focal point of, of, or the point of interest in your piece. And so that's uh, something that I'll definitely do with this is where I'm like, I'll pull something from here and I'm gonna like make it kind of drag through down to the bottom like this and kind of do sort of this like S curve shape where maybe it's following this sh shadow down into the chin down here, you know? And then just trying to create interesting visual highways that allow for your eye to keep going in and through the, the portrait. Um, Sargent was really known for also like you know, as you go from the focal point, things get a more, less understood, more abbreviated <coughs> and loose. And that's another thing that I'm really interested in is, is trying to um, have your eye funnel towards the thing that's interesting or, uh, or that you want to be the point of interest. Brock, you uh, have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's what you just last said. is like all about directing the viewer's eye to your focal point. Um, so yeah, complementary colors. Um, try to not make it more interesting than uh, than the portrait itself. A good background you shouldn't even really notice. It's just a supporting uh, supporting the um, the portrait. Wow, that one went by fast. Are we about like at the halfway point for the night then? Mm -hmm. Might be a little past it, I think. No, we're right about the halfway point. Hannah's like, oh man, we're only halfway. <laughs> it definitely goes faster for us on this side. Yeah. She's like, I'm dying here. <laughs> Right now it's just, it's 
kind of like we were talking about a second ago, sort of bits of pushing and pulling and times where I'm thinking about color and now I'm thinking about drawing and going back and forth, back and forth. Mitchell asks, do you think a background is necessary? For example, in the drawing, would it be fine to just focus on the portrait and leave the rest of the page blank? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Go ahead, Brock, you, you go. Yeah, no, um, especially for a drawing. And like, I try to think of drawing as kind of like a, a study, you know, that maybe you could take to a painting, but um, you can do that in paint too. You can, of course, you can do studies. But for this, it's not so much the purpose of like, an effect. It's more about understanding like the sitter and the, the subject. It's like it's much more about that than trying to create an atmosphere. And um, pencil is much more of like a linear tool than it is like a tonal tool. Like if I was doing charcoal, maybe I probably would add the background. Um, it does kind of come down to preference and the amount of time you have though. Mm -hmm. Every passing minute, I can see Hannah's like, "Yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna come back after all oh, this. This is this is hard." <laughs> Trying to find the significance in this in this little spot I've been staring at for the while. <laughs> it's exactly how I felt last time I modeled. <laughs> Yeah, Any, anybody who thinks that modeling is easy, come by. Be a model for a day. Try it out. It's the, there's a reason we pay them $64,000 an hour. <laughs> I'm just, just, kid, just kidding. Just <laughs> kidding. I think I would be a model forever if that was the case. C. McQueen asks, describe your typical day. 
Do you paint or draw every day? Um, how about we start from you, Brock, and we'll yeah. go around. Yeah, I try to. Um, if I know that I'm not going to have enough time to paint or uh, get set up, or um, if I'm, especially if I have like a teaching day, um, I try to at least fit a little sketch in. Um, so I like to draw with the, the students quite a bit if we have a figure model and uh, or a portrait sitter. So at least get a little bit of drawing in. Um, or even copies. Like I love doing copies. I feel like I learn a lot just by kind of been doing a lot of Van Dyke drawings. And you kind of really get to get inside their their mindset and their process. Mm. And um, you can kind of start to see things the way that they saw them and the decisions that they made. So I'm at least trying to do that, but I try to paint as often as, as, often as I can. Uh, I would love to. I, I probably don't get to paint every day. Um, I have so much going on. I'm, I'm one of those people that constantly adds more irons to the fire, probably way more than I should. So, um, but I do try to paint at least four and a half to five days a week. It would be, uh, would be a successful week for me. Um, you know, it's just like anything. You, you, art, if you're trying to do it professionally, is a business and you've got to make it all run and you got to communicate to people and, you know, East Oaks is, you know, it's, it's a small team, and so we wear a lot of hats and try to make it all work, and, um, and so we have a lot of responsibilities uh, shared amongst us. So for those reasons, yeah, it's tough. you you got to find ways to make it all work. Um, but in an ideal world, I think, yeah, I have, would probably, I don't know if I'd ever paint every day. Um, my personality is is that I would get burned out if I did it every day. Um, and so I like to keep it to where I'm painting like probably, you know, most days of the week, but I think I'd lose my appreciation for how, how much I love it if I, if I did it absolutely every day. I, uh, we're, we're on a, Lisa and I are kind of on a uh, Monday through Saturday. Schedule. So trying to get in there uh, six days, and then um, uh, time-wise is just anywhere from probably uh, like if we have a certain amount of chores to do or something like that, or places to, that we need to be, it's probably between uh, five and ten hours, I would say, in the studio. Um, it's mostly drawing right now, but, um, and then Sunday, um, I usually have plans to try to get in there, but Sometimes I'll walk by uh, something that I can't let sit. So yeah. I end up doing something <laughs> on Sunday, anyways. But, but. Boy, I do know that feeling, though. Yeah. Like you walk by and you're just like, no, I gotta <laughs> fix that. <laughs> yeah, I keep saying we're gonna you know, work from like uh, 9 to starting around 11 and then just going until, you know, uh, 10 o'clock at night when you're just so <laughs> you can't sleep, you know, mm -hmm. you just see everything and your hand and stuff. But that seems to be when I'm most, that just must be when I'm most uh, creative or most That's creative, it. I guess. Can't fight it.
Brock, Matthew would like to know, is Great Lakes Academy of Fine Art currently looking for figure models? Yeah, uh, we are always looking for figure models. Um, if you're interested, <coughs> go ahead and email uh, info at greatlakesacademyoffineart.com. You can go from there. Yeah, there's always a, always a need for figure models. We've been really fortunate in Duluth. We've got a great crew of figure models, and it's not an easy job, so we really appreciate their, their hard work. Yeah, that's another just hold, holding some of the poses. If it's a difficult pose, man, it can be crazy, crazy difficult and hard. So I'd, I would, hats tipped off to him. And even if it is an easy pose, like three hours is a long time yep. <laughs> to hold any position. Hand is like, mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this tilt. Um, you know, I've, I've done portrait models several, modeling myself several times when like we're missing a, a model or something. And now everybody should do it once to see how difficult it can be because it really, it really has a serious challenge to it. You said you modeled? Uh, not figure, okay. I did portrait. Oh, okay. um, but uh, we would, every now and again, if we had like a portrait model for some reason, call in sick or something, and we, we'd have to like decide, you know, is there somebody in our group that would be willing to sit up there? And I've sat up there several times and yeah, it's not easy. Last time Michael and all of us were doing this, he finished the painting. He's like, yeah, I only used two brushes. And I had like 17 in my hand. I was like, what? <laughs> Starting to feel that way right now. Getting close to my 17. Yeah, it's almost kind of like you're waiting for him to be like, now for my next magical trick.
Jim asks, anyone key thought on getting a likeness? He asked what now about likeness? Is there any one key thought on getting a likeness? Ooh. <laughs> Sum up in one word. Um, I think that w one of the things that has really helped me in my pursuit to try to get a likeness with people is there's two different things. It's like how you see and perceive a person from a distance and how you perceive a person up close. And so I believe that there's like shadow shape and then there's contour. Um, the shadow shape is like if you can see somebody from a distance, like, a, you know, say they're 100 yards away and you know it's them. That's because you understand what their shadow shape looks like. Um, and but there's also this idea that when you're up close to somebody, you can see their contour, which has a lot more to do with um, your drawing ability, you know. And um, those two things, if they can be married together well, um, there's a, I use this example a lot of a, an illusion of Einstein and Marilyn Monroe. And if you look up close at it, you see the contours of Einstein. But if you look at it far away, it looks like the shadow shapes of Marilyn Monroe. So what happens a lot of times is, is people don't have their shadow shapes married to the contour. And so they end up having like an Einstein up close and a Marilyn Monroe far, far away. So um, I think that's what people have a lot of issues with. So if I were to sum up just like one thing uh, for likeness, is if you can get those two to work together to look like the person, then you can really get a strong, strong likeness. One of the things I try to avoid <clears throat> in getting a likeness is thinking too much about getting the likeness. <laughs> mm. It's like, I don't know, it really does come down to shapes um, and structure and you know, how does the skull work. Like you were saying, like the big, the big shapes, you can recognize someone from a distance and you don't see any of their features or their details. Yep. Um, so that's the most important thing. I try to hold off on putting the features in for as long as possible. I keep it pretty ghosty. I'm just playing around with the big masses and the big kind of underlying uh, skull and the structure first. And if that's all done correctly, the, the features can be placed pretty easily. And then there's a likeness most of the time. Once I think, OK, the eyes are starting to look, look like hers, then usually it's time to kind of erase them back yeah. and <laughs> revisit yeah. the, uh, the big structure before you commit. Yeah. Sarasa asks, where can we find your work portfolio? Brock? Um, let's see, I need to update my website, like yeah. I was saying. <laughs> but, um, most of my stuff is just, I post it on Instagram. It's just easiest to upload. And, mm. um, but I am going to be doing some work on my website pretty soon here. So uh, either one. Uh, yeah, I would say the same. I'm, I'm, I'm bad about doing both, but I would say that um, 
Instagram has some of the latest stuff, and my website actually um, was starting to upload a few things just a few nights ago. So um, I need to put some more on there, but that, that would be a place to start. Um, I probably don't have as, as much as I should on there. But, oh yeah, my website is um, lcar.fasco.com. Mm. What is it like a three by five or four by five? Um, yeah, if yeah. Gonna, if all of a sudden everybody <laughs> starts, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Thing, but, but yeah, that's where everybody just starts painting in squares. Yeah, a square <laughs> format. But yeah, that's that's where everybody I look at is is on. So that's where. Yeah, I. Uh, I'm the same way. If I'm looking someone up, first place I go is Instagram, mm -hmm. which is so sad because, like, if that was the case, you would think I'd post more to, like, <laughs> you know. But um, I don't know. I have such a hard, like, aversion to posting. I have nine posts. Woo! I think I'm close. I'm <laughs> running in a close second to you on that. <laughs> Oh <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, everybody's like, where can I go? <laughs> Mine is just Brock Larson Studio. So Christina asked a couple questions. What would be a proper lighting for a model? Like how bright and far must the light be from the model? Um, so I think that the proper light with, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of ways to light your model. Um, I would say that 
a good one to start with is just to like, I, I tell people the kind of a good place to start with these sort of um, how did Van Dyke or Rembrandt like their models, which was sort of a top left or a top right coming down and where there was sort of raking light over one of the sides of the cheek. And so you'll hear this thing called like the Van Dyke Z, which she has kind of happening with her that's it's the uh, it's where the shadow makes like this Z formation from underneath her nose up the side of her nose and under her um, her brow. And um, so if you go and look like the Van Dyke stuff, like large majority of his paintings had that. Uh, and then you hear about the Rembrandt triangle, and basically that's if somebody just turned their head just a little more right to the right than where Hannah has hers, and it creates like a little triangle on the cheek right here. So she's um, almost to that point where you would have that triangle uh, be more prominent. You know, I mean, that's just a good rule of thumb to like start with, um, but by no means do you have to have to do that, but you know, I feel like people just don't even know where to start sometimes, and that would maybe help them find a place to start. Lucy, is your mic on? Oh my gosh, <laughs> no it wasn't, it wasn't on. <laughs> Could, should I written do all of that again, or uh, could you hear me well enough? I heard you pretty well. Okay. Gotcha. And Christina's other question was, any suggestion to fix the charcoal before painting? Thanks. Honestly, if you're painting with, if you're if you're using your charcoal as as your underdrawing, um, I don't think you even have to fix it because it just goes straight into the paint. Um, I know Alex does that a lot. You know, blocks in with charcoal. Uh, the only thing I would say you don't do, which you're not asking about or talking about, is that um, is not to use graphite because the shards of the graphite do come to the surface when you're painting on top of it. So as long as you're using charcoal, I think you can paint right over without having it to be fixed. Um, Brock, do you fix do charcoal underpaintings mm -hmm. or uh, block ends, and do you fix them? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, talk about it. Um, yeah, I, I try to keep it pretty minimal. Like it's basically just kind of like um, my basic guidelines, uh, kind of my big compositional structure first, and then I'll dive in and do most of the drawing in the paint. So it's just kind of like playing around um, with my large placements. I don't like painting on top of a detailed drawing. Uh, it feels too much like a paint by number. Mm. And um, I don't know, I just kind of lose interest in it sooner. But I didn't know that about graphite. That's that's interesting, that it comes to the surface. Yeah, I've actually um, had. Some, I mean, I didn't ruin the painting site, but it took. I had to repaint parts of it several times over because it kept bleeding to the surface. Wow. Something. To, I don't know what the chemical reaction is, but basically, it it mixes with the paint somehow and like brings itself to. Yeah, it's weird. Really, really weird. <laughs> I think um, if, if your main concern is losing the drawing, if you want to do 
do a tight going and maintain it. Uh, fixing it, you might still lose a little if you use solvent in your first layer. Um, so I know some people will take a, a fine line brush, put maybe some like uh, some liquid, uh, and, and I don't know if this would, would be for everybody, or some kind of medium to, um, to make it flow really good and uh, do like a, uh, a yellow ochre or some kind of ochre or raw umber and, and uh, kind of ink in the lines. Mm. Uh, something light enough that it'll disappear under the paint if you're, and then let that dry. So if you're, if you're starting out and you're kind of really concerned about losing a drawing, um, that can be a way to, to preserve it underneath the bear if you're having problems with it disappearing with the, just using fixative. But I have heard of people doing that just using fixative. It just depends on how rough you are, I guess, with your first layer if you start scrubbing that up, that can be kind of frustrating to lose your careful drawing. So um, I know a lot of people will ink it in with uh, a fine brush and and some thin paint, some kind of ochre. That's good. Good info. How many sessions after this one? Uh, one? Yeah, we have one session after this. Shh. I'm not supposed to say that. You're like, oh, we have 10 minutes left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's say that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how dare you think it's only been five minutes? That actually will be uh, pretty perfect for bringing us to, after the break, bringing us to Magnavox. Thank you, Hannah. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. 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 Gwendolyn asks, how do you avoid getting muddy colors whilst doing a la prima? Oh, good question. Um, I think that, well, there's, there's a lot to that question, but I, I, I think that one of the things that happens with muddy colors is, is what association of colors do you put next to colors? Um, and what if you have like too many warms next to each other without a balance of a cool color or a cool note um, then things colors can seem muddy uh, but also it's how you're mixing your colors so um, you as long as the value doesn't go up or down you can actually shift warm and cool within that same value um, i know that sounds i'm probably getting a little more technical but um, basically, it help you can you can figure out how to uh, manipulate the the cools and warms as long as the light or dark doesn't change. You know, it's when you start shifting the light and the dark um, and shifting it cool or warm when when you had another one that you can start kind of muddying up. Um, basically, it's the same thing. You're muddying up the separation between your warms and cools. Um, but honestly, it could be a lot of different things, you know. Um, it could be um, how you're layering your thick and thin and how you're switching over with that. But I find that more often than the case, it has to do with your 
combination of warm and cool. You guys have any thoughts on that? Is that why you have 17 brushes too? Maybe just mm -hmm. kind of keeping them clean. Mm -hmm. and... That's it. Yeah, I run into muddy colors too, but I'm, yeah, I try to use as few brushes as possible. So that's probably one of the reasons. yourself to not um, be kind of lazy in the moment and uh, think that it'll work out just fine and just kind of, at least for me starting out, it's been um, uh, kind of really important to uh, keep a separate brush for, for each individual kind of value and color and I, I get kind of uh, crazy with that in terms of I have to wash like 20 brushes at the end session because as soon as one gets uh, uh, kind of muddied up I don't tend to use uh, turps uh, too much in the studio so uh, as soon as one starts to get uh, muddied up I kind of set it aside and, and start with a, a fresh brush <laughs> and yeah one thing I'll do too I notice is like if I do notice that it's getting pretty muddy I'll actually just scrape it and then just try to reapply some fresh mm -hmm. colors and values. It's really hard to fight and to get back with that. Especially on Fremont, you know. Yeah, when I did more on Fremont, it was about um, not having enough paint on there. And, mm -hmm. and then trying to go in with even less paint and thinking I was going to fix it. So and yeah. sometimes just yeah. have to take a leap something that you think is thick and it's actually not very thick. Oh man. Definitely. Well then we talk about being brave though, or I talk about it. It's like it's like real bravery. It's so weird how that's so true though, you know? Um, it's so weird because there is s such a fear sometimes in how you're like painting and you know you're like oh I don't want to mess this up you know because I put so much effort into it and I'll never forget filming um, Brock's dad Jeff and him being like you know this this might be like something where you like you're really scared to like try it but do it, and if it's wrong, well, nobody died. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? it's just a painting. It's just a painting, and at the end of the day, that's so true. Um, definitely learn to be fearless with your paint. Uh, and this is, I'm, you know, speaking to myself because I do it all the time.
is so quiet. Concentrating. Are we on the last session or is the second to the last session? Four more sessions. I was like, That's I hope this is, a joke. <laughs> this is a joke for her. Uh, we got five minutes left, and there's a five minute break, and one more session. Sweet. Okay. Whew. No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> You've been able to hold the smile for this long is incredible. <laughs> All right, audience, y'all need to ask some more questions. Love to know what y'all are thinking. If y'all hadn't gotten bored and left us already, come back. We have more interesting answers. <laughs>
Gwendolyn says, I can see you're using paint very thinly. What are your <laughs> views on using thick or thin layers of paint? It is my all-time struggle. <laughs> I, I am just a complete thin painter, have always been a thin painter, and I've, um, I'm still slowly working my way up to be a thicker painter. But um, my, one of my thoughts there is, is we, we're always like challenging ourselves. So I'm always challenging myself to be more of a thick, paint, thick painter. Um, however, I also think that it is ourselves challenging ourselves, but also that we are part of the character of our identity and our work is the tendencies that, tendencies that we have. So I might always be a thin painter, but that doesn't mean that like I can't try to press on to be more of a thick painter, but it will only probably shift my, my um, painting techniques and what I do, you know, just more subtly. Um, so the residue of who I am and what I tend to do will still probably be there. Um, and so it's just something I'm also practicing to, to do more. Um, I tend to paint either uh, thicker strokes and stuff near the end of my paintings that are more layered and then like glaze over them, um, you know, like where I'm doing more impasto stuff. It just depends. I actually do some at the very beginning too. Um, but a la prima painting, I'm going so quickly and I'm mixing with my brush and that doesn't help. Um, that doesn't help matters either um, that I mix with my brush. If I used a palette knife, I'd probably be a much more thick painter because I would have thicker paint. Uh, in my pool of paint. And I'm sure you heard this last one will be your last one, and uh, it'll be if we're going right up to nine, are we going a little, are we going a little over? Um, that's I think that's we'll probably go right to nine. If we go right to nine, then yeah, it'll be a slightly uh, eighteen. Minutes. Yeah, eighteen minutes. So, um, <clears throat> doing awesome. <laughs> I'm giving you your sort of little smirky grin that you have in there. I like it a lot. Yeah. Okay, it gives you some. Sounds on. Always thinking about like how the heck am I gonna get? What am I? What am I, you know? Now it's like decision time, you know. Eric asks, which artists working today are exciting you the most? Brock, I would like to hear you oh. answer on that one. Let's see, there's a lot of great painters out there right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've always been a fan of Mark Delacio's work, mm. his landscapes, his plein air and his studio pieces especially. Actually, I really love his studio compositions. Um, a lot of Russian painters. Um, let's see. What's that Russian girl's name that I'm like, I really love her work. Exactly. What's about her, about what's her like name? Ksenia. Yeah, Ksenia or something? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Is, I'm all about her work. Just the sheer number of them that she puts out there, too. Like, oh, she's, she's so prolific. Mm -hmm. Well, that's somebody that when I see her work, I get really excited about. Sure. Brock Larson, I love his work. I get really excited. Lewis Connors. Yeah, Brett. Incredible painter. 
I look at his nine images over and over again. And next question is from H.H. H. Melton. Do any of you maintain sketchbooks? If so, can you do a video on that one day? These videos are so helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely have a sketchbook at all times. That would be a cool video, though. I like. Yeah, would be. Um, I would be. I would say that I wish I did more sketchbooking than I do. Um, I, I definitely do, but I, no, I don't have one with me on it all, at all times. Um, I tend to do it like more in the evenings when I'm like thinking up ideas um, and I'm trying to draw out compositions for the ideas or if I'm just trying to like hack out the, the narrative or things like that. Um, Typically, I have a sketchbook, but it's funny because my computer ends up being what a lot of people's sketchbook is for them in a way. Um, I, I draw with it. I'm constantly pulling images together and coming up with ideas through it. But um, it's one of those things I always aspire to want to be <laughs> do it more than I do. And um, maybe that should be my New Year's resolution. And Jenna asks, what colors are best for studio walls? Um, wow. Uh, I mean, most people tend to go neutral. Um, I don't know. I think maybe a warmer neutral. But um, I'm not sure if I know the science behind it. Um, it's funny, though, because I feel like sometimes <coughs> when I was at, like, GCA and they had very very neutral walls and I felt like everybody's work turned out very gray <laughs> but that might be more of a 
uh, not teaching color problem than anything. <laughs> but I always wondered if it was because of the walls. Because everything around is just neutral and you're painting the people that are in neutral and, you know. I kind of like the neutral, I guess. I like the, um, that you can kind of push and pull the warm and cools and kind of make more decisions based off of, mm. you know, like we were talking earlier about like kind of enhancing the the portrait best or the, the figure. Mm -hmm. If it's too warm or too cool, I feel like it's, it can become overpowering, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mitchell asks, any of you use pastel for your portraits? Seems like it would be a great medium for this genre of art. Um, I actually, when I first started out, that's all I did. Oh, really? Hmm. Yep. Uh, before I got into oil painting, I did all my portraits in either charcoal or oil pastel. Cool. Um, so, Brings me back. <laughs> I've never tried it, but I'd really like to someday. Yeah, they're fun to work with. I but um, lately, I was talking to a friend. I was we were, we were kind of talking about the fact that you know I would kind of almost get scared of the toxicity level of of working with some of the pigments, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they don't have as toxic as pigments, but I think some of them are the same pigments that we have in oil paint, but they get airborne and that, mm. and I'm like, oh, that's kind of freaky, you know. Um, but aside from that, um, as long as you have good ventilation, yeah, I, I would like to kind of maybe get it back into it for the fun of it. It's, it's funny though because like when you start j diving down in the rabbit hole of any medium that you've like devoted yourself to, it, you just you realize, wow. Well, if I want to like devote myself to this thing, I got <laughs> um, this one thing is so deep that it'll take the rest of my life to to learn it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you end up choosing to do a particular thing, I guess. I don't know if that was very helpful for him, but yeah, I'd like to try it again. Is there a reason that you made the switch? Yeah, just um, it was always an area that I wanted to go to, and I felt like it was a transitional medium to get into to eventually get to where I wanted to go. Mm. But yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Colors, um, just add a little element to uh, portraiture. It's, it's been really fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've never done like full on oil pastel. I would do a, a cup. Of 
Um, well, I did enjoy it when I when I did it. I, I have some friends that do it, and you know, I, I think part of the fun is that it's just it's kind of good and messy. You know, I mean, oil <laughs> paint is too, but <laughs> um, I don't know. There's something about it that I think would be fun. How are we going? Four forty-five left. hear the whir of everyone's pencils and, <laughs> and brushes. And just, <laughs> hurry, hurry. Time to fix it. Yeah. <laughs>
Am I able to fix all the things in like 30 seconds? <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> 20 seconds? <laughs> Fixed it. Perfect. Yep. The seat. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Wait. Hold on. One little. <laughs> Two hours. Wait. Hold on. Hold on. One more. No. <laughs> I'm good. All right. Way to go. Hey, Hannah. Woo. Thank you. That was awesome. You did such a great job. Um, all right. Uh, go to the wine. Thank you all everyone for watching tonight. I hope you enjoyed uh, painting from, oil painting from life session seven and sketching. And um, hope you would join us for the next one. Have a good night and thanks again. If uh, you like this, if you're on like YouTube or something, please like and share. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please email us at info at eastokestudio.com. Check out our products if you have a chance. Remember tomorrow is a Brock Larson is going to be actually doing um, instructional, uh, several days of instruction on how to do exactly what he was doing tonight. And it'll be a different model every day. So uh, come join us. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Have a good night.